We got James Bell of the Boxing Source here live with the WBC Featherweight Champion of the World, Mr. Gary Russell Jr. What's going on, my man? Man, you see what it is. We're in motion all day, every day, 24-7. We're in the dungeon right now. We're in the dungeon. We don't need a whole lot of pretty stuff, all the elaborate gems. This shit right here, where it's at? Let's get it done. Yeah, so you be doing your work here at the uh, Nigba Boxing Gym. This is like, you know, where you go to work before all your fights That's and, right. you know, how you stay sharp and everything That's like right. that. So how long you been doing it at this gym? We've been at this particular gym for about two and a half years now. I like it, though. I like this one better than any of the other ones because a lot of these gyms, like you say, you got all the pretty fancy equipment and all that. I ain't with none of that. We always got it all the way from the dirt. You know, so this is exactly what it is, you know. It's grimy, it's hot, you know, it's hot, you know, it's, you don't got a lot of distractions in here. You got all the equipment that you need to get the job done. So, this is what it is. Yeah, it's just uh, everything is all here. Everything that you need is here, right here for you. So, you'll be able to do what you need and just uh, get it done there. You defended your WBC featherweight championship earlier this year. And... Uh, just seeing here what's going on with the featherweight division. Of course, right, right, right. we know what's going on with the other featherweight champions. And um, right now, you have a certain IBF featherweight champion that's out there, Mr. Josh Warrington. And he's kind of getting a little bit confident with that title that he has. But he hasn't really, you know, mentioned your name that much. No, not that much. Yeah, um, we wanted to get the fight with Josh uh, Warrington. I think when he first got the title uh, back when, or maybe right before he had the title, one of the two, where they was not interested at all for whatever reason. Um, like I say, we ready, we hungry for what any of the champions in the division. I've been ready, I've been hungry. Josh Warrington, you know, he's a good fighter. I mean, I guess he's able to capture the title. You have to take your hat off to him for that. You know, to be able to become a world champion, you have to put the work in and the hard work and the effort. I get it. But he's nothing more than a club fighter. He's a straightforward fighter, throws wild haymakers with really no little power at all. So he come to me with that, he's going to get his ass beat. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, I think he won that title the same the same day that uh, you defended your title uh, over he at the fought, MGM. He, I just, yeah. he just fought Kid Gallahan or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he, right? he did fight Kid Gallahan, yeah. and, you know, uh, I don't know um, if they really. Thought that he came out of that fight all too yeah, well. You so. know, I mean, I thought that was a close fight with Kay Gallahan. You know, um, I didn't watch too much of it, but I, the little bit that I did see, it looked very competitive, looked close. He just fought a cold, complete nobody his last fight. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, man. Until these dudes say they ready, man, y'all know what I'm at. I'm in here, I'm hungry, shopping my tools up, ready to work. Yeah. Now, we had the WBC convention recently. And they had, uh, you know, set those orders in reference to mandatories. And your mandatory is uh, Tuxat Nyambar. And I think I saw him in a card, you know, a couple of months ago. But I'm not sure if, uh, you know, he's necessarily ready. I mean, they try to, you know, boost him up, you know, how they do it with uh, a lot of those fighters. You know, they're overseas and things like that. He's had, you know, his recent fight over here stateside, but, you know, they're trying to set him up as the uh, next contender for that WBC featherweight championship. I mean, Will, you got to look at it this way. These guys, these mandatories, they work their way up the rankings, you know, so if they became a mandatory, that means they are the best that was in the division that was up under them. You know, they're, they're the best. They work their way all the way up the rankings. From, the num from whatever the number is, all the way up to the number one contender to be able to compete for the title. So you have to take that into consideration when you deal with the mandatory fighters. You know, you got these guys and they consider them a mandatory challenger and people will look at these guys and well, say, hey, well, he must not be a threat. But you got to take into mind, take the credibility that he had to beat these certain people to get to the position in which that he's in. Um, like I say, we ain't done no smoke. If that's who they got, line their ass up, they can get dusted all the time. Yeah, I mean, all it, all it takes for them is just to step up. I mean, you know, JoJo Diaz was able to work himself to be the mandatory contender at one point. And once he won that mandatory position, he called you out, you answered the call, 
he stepped up the fight, but couldn't get the job done. I mean, JoJo's the fighter that I definitely take my hat off to. He's one of the uh, guys that was willing to compete. You know, he's willing to compete against the best. He's willing to fight the best. He wants to fight the best. He wants to test himself against the people that they consider to be the best in the game in, in or around in the division that he competes in. I can respect that from a fighter. You know, um, Tank Davis, Leo Santa Cruz, these guys, they kind of cherry pick, pick and choose who they want to fight. So they kind of like made up makeshift champions to a certain extent. They're not real fighters in my eyes to a certain extent. Unless you're willing to fight everybody or anybody that it is, then I consider yourself a fighter. Well, the thing with uh, those two guys, Gavante Tank Davis and Leo Santa Cruz, it seems like they already line up fighters for them to fight before you know anything takes place. And in reference to you know Tank Davis, you know they had his recent fight over in Baltimore, and the co-feature, you know, had Yuriorkis Gamboa on there and. For me, when I saw that particular fight in the co-feature and the main event, I was like, I knew that they were going to try to set that, set that up. And here we are, you know, a couple yeah. months later, they're trying to lock that down yeah. either for, you know, New York or Atlanta or something like that something for like Gavante that. Davis. Right. And a lot New of people... But it, I, I find it funny because Javante Tank Davis said that... Uh, when they asked him about competing against me, he said, well, we ain't thinking about Gary. He's old. He's this. But the guy who he's about to compete against is six or seven years my senior. So what are mm -hmm. you talking about? Like, come on, man. Make some of this shit make some type of sense. They can miss me with the bullshit. I'm ready for it. Come see me, y'all. Yeah, and the thing about it is, it's like last time when I uh, interviewed you um, after the JoJo Diaz fight, you said that you were ready to unify and also that you were willing to move up if you had to. Oh, yeah. And I find it kind of surprising that Tank Davis in particular moved himself up from the super featherweight division to the lightweight division. You know, so it kind of like opens things up there in the super featherweight division, but also it just says that a lot of these guys are moving up from either featherweight or super featherweight and you know not really challenging you yeah. in reference to that so what you think about I mean, that i think everyone has their own destiny and their own cross that they got to carry at the end of the day you know um i can't focus on that i want to compete against the guys that they consider the best you know and i've held my title i'm the longest reigning wbc champion current of the date hands down you know um i held my title longer than any other champion uh, i feel as though i'm the best in the division and near or even around my division, I want to compete against any of the guys that they say the best. You know, um, I can't speak on these other guys, man. Uh, maybe they want to continue to pick and choose who they want to fight. I never, I never had that that thought process as a fighter. Mm -hmm. I don't care if somebody came in here and it was 250 pounds. They said they want to fight me as a man. There's a certain sense of integrity. There's a certain sense of testosterone and shit that mm -hmm. just kicks in to be like, nah. I I don't give a fuck about how big you are, none of that. We we gonna we gonna, we gonna have fight, to, you, we then gonna, let's fight. to make something happen. Yeah. You know, so I feel like as a fighter that's the attitude that you're supposed to have to be to be able to participate in this sport. And with a lot of these guys are showing is a big contradiction to that. Now, you also said that, you know, while this is a very physical sport, it's a mental sport as well. And you kind of like incorporate that in a lot of your fights and also, you know, in the commentary that you have in preparation for your fights. So kind of like going to that a little bit as far as like how important it is to have, a, you know, mental approach to the sport in general and also to your opponent, whoever that is. Um, I tell people that boxing is intellect manifested on the physical form. In most cases, the more educated person should win. It's not about size, it's not about none of that. It's about intellect. In most cases, the smartest person should win. You know, I don't, it doesn't matter how hard you hit, because if you can't land these hard shots, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, it's, it's to be able, I think it's genius to be able to break something down in a millisecond uh, control, I call it controlled chaos. When you're in the ring, it's controlled chaos. To be able to have the mental capacity to be able 
to see exactly what your opponent is about to do, to read it, to be able to make the necessary adjustments, to counter, <laughs> you know, to, to completely take it away from them, to see yeah. a person trying to do something, and to have the ability to, the intellect, to be able to see what he's trying to do, mm -hmm. to see how he's trying to do it, and how I could capitalize on what he's doing or take it completely away from him. I think that's genius to a certain extent, to be able to break something down like that and do it within a millisecond. You know, I think that's something that's great. I think that's the thing that a lot of people lack. In most cases, fighters, it's all physical attributes. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of these guys, they just be in great condition. They be in great condition, strength up, strong, and they just go in there and fight. You know, it's all a physical attribute. They're not winning because they're technically better. They're not mm -hmm. winning because, okay, what I'm doing right now isn't working. Let me make the necessary adjustments to adapt to whatever is coming across my way. These guys aren't winning because of that. I have the ability to do so. This is one of the reasons why a lot of these guys stray away from me. Now, we kind of like saw that, or at least I, I, I saw that firsthand in that JoJo Diaz fight. Because, you know, those first few rounds, it looked like he was a little bit competitive. But after like the fifth, sixth round or so, made those proper adjustments, oh, yeah, he and he didn't have, he didn't lost necessarily have an answer after that, and pretty much came out to a clear victory for, for you in that particular fight. You know what I mean? Um, kind of like going to your relationship with your brothers, Antonio and Antoine. I know that they have a... Both of them have a fight coming up next Saturday right. at the MGM National Harbor. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a close bond with them That's inside right. and outside of the ring. And I see you, you know, there, you know, also in the corner with them when they do fight. So kind of like going to that a little bit. Man, they're my brothers. What else do you want me to say? They're my everything, man. Um, it's funny because when you when you're a fighter and you have a coach or you have a trainer, you have to have a certain level of trust and belief in your coach or your trainer to go out there in the heat of battle, in chaos, and, and try to attempt to do whatever it is that someone else is telling you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to have a certain level of trust and belief in the person to do that. Um, I think it's cool that my younger brother has had the opportunity to have me as a role model, someone, to look up to, someone that they can see all the work and effort and sacrificing that I put into it and see the results of it, see the benefits of it for them to actually be humble enough to accept constructive criticism, still listen. You know, when you got a young man, you got a lot of testosterone, you know, you tend to mm -hmm. want to do whatever you want to do, but for them to have the mental capacity to be able to still humble themselves and listen and follow instructions and still pay attention to what's going on and make the necessary adjustments, I think that's amazing. Um, even when, if, when my career of boxing is over with, I always be in my younger brother's corner supporting him and backing him. And I think hopefully what I want, you know, we always talk about a dynasty. And my yeah. definition of a dynasty is, is information being passed down from generation to generation to generation to ultimately stronger each generation. You know, um, by the time my younger brothers get to the age that I am and get to the point <laughs> that I am, I expect for them to be better than what I am and much further than where I am right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, to follow up with that, you have that relationship with your brothers. You go into your relationship with your father as he has been a key, key point in your professional career and him guiding you from your start up to this point right now. I mean, like I say, it goes back into a level of belief and trust. You know, even if my father was to tell me something wrong and it, uh, and, it, <laughs> and it was harmful to me in my eyes, I know he was been telling me, he was, in his best interest, he felt as though it was something that was good for me. You know, um, he hasn't let me down yet. He's taught me everything that I know, as well as my younger brothers, up until this point, to the creativity, to the ring savviness, to the boxing IQ, to the punching ability, and you know, everything else that you see inside and out the ring. I'm a complete representation of my father. I'm a reflection of him. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, going back into this uh, thing with the WBC, been a long time holder of the WBC Featherweight Championship. That's right. And you faced 
you know, contenders that stepped up and, you know, took them out. Um, what do you think about this current situation with the WBC and as far as like, you know, how they are incorporating this franchise champion thing? Honestly, I'm, I honestly don't know, to be honest with you. I think it's a lot of stuff that goes on that a lot of the fighters that even participate in have no idea what's going on. You know, I don't know how they're doing to some of these franchise champions. Even even when, even as of now, and I'm the WBC champion, but they had Leo Santa Cruz. He was the WBC diamond the champion, champion or something. Like, I'm yeah. what the fuck type of title is that? Are they just making up titles now at this point? I'm not sure. I know I have the WBC championships. Out. That's the ultimate belt that there possibly could be. And now they just create these other titles for whatever reason. I'm not sure. Line up, phone is up. I'm going to dust their ass off. It's just that simple at this point. <laughs> Franchise champion, diamond champion, yeah, Mayan like, champion. Yeah, it's like, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. I don't know either. But, you know, going into, you know, this thing with, um, you know, Leo Santa Cruz, of course, he had that little past history, uh, you know, with him and, you know, the people around him. And he's kind of like acted like he's moved on from that. What do you think about that? What do I think about, about what? Him acting like he moved on from what? As in, like, he is not interested in trying to fight you. <laughs> Even though he claims, he has claimed in the past that he said that he wanted to fight you. I mean, I don't know. I'm an entertainer to the fans that's watching, to the fans that's out here. I'm trying to make the fight happen. I want to entertain you guys. I want to fight the people that's supposed to be the best. I can't make these guys get in the ring. I can't force them. What I can do is show you guys exactly some of the tricks and shit that they're doing to try to get around not competing against some of the best fighters that's in the world. Now, going into that, you know, me being in the boxing media game or whatever it is, I kind of, you know, follow and take notes and kind of like watch what other people within boxing media are saying. And one of the things that I kind of heard was that they say that other boxers aren't necessarily, you know, afraid or scared to fight Gary Russell Jr. And that they kind of like make the claim that you're quote unquote difficult to work with, which I'm like, Never really heard that before in reference well, that's, to that's Gary crazy. Russell Jr. That's crazy. Well, if they consider someone that takes their own destiny in their own hands and not allow someone else to control and pick and choose what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it, difficult, then I guess I am a difficult individual to deal with. Because I'm the type of person, um, I don't like people to to just be able to call all the shots. First of all, when, when, when fighters compete, when fighters compete, people tune in to see the fighters. They don't tune in to see the managers. They don't tune in to see the promoters. They don't tune in to see none of the motherfucking people that's behind the scenes at all. Simply the fighters. That's it, that's all. So why is it that the managers, the promoters, and all the other people behind the scenes have something negative or derogatory to say when there's nothing dealing with you at all? You know, everything that goes on is based upon the fact of the fighters. You know, a lot of the managers and promoters, they take advantage of these fighters and take advantage of these guys taking their money and et cetera. A lot of fighters are not getting their just due. They're not receiving the benefit. I mean, these fighters, are, I mean, some guy just died not too long ago. Patrick Day. Patrick Day, he just died not too long ago. And guess what? The guy didn't even make $50,000. That's crazy, probably not even enough to bury him. You know, not enough for his family. You know, I think that is the stuff that makes it different. When you got people that's really genuinely putting the hard work and the effort and sacrificing into it, their blood, sweat, and tears to try to make a living for themselves to be able to provide for their families and their loved ones. And you have other people that's behind the scenes that's trying to take advantage of you and take a big percentage of your money and stuff like that. And then you go and you tell them, nah, that shit ain't right. I need all my money. I need a piece of this. I need a piece of that and a piece of that. Now I'm difficult to work with. I'm difficult to work with because they're so used and so comfortable of getting over on so many other fighters because fighters have a black eye or a stigma of this, this thing put up under them 
that uh, fi all fighters are ignorant, they don't understand the concept of business and this, that, and the third, but guess what? This one is not. So if you consider that difficult to work with, then that most definitely difficult to work with. If you want to do business with me, I believe in the sense of transparency. I don't believe on all that sneaky stuff hiding under the table. No, no, I don't believe in none of that. So if, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, boxers are independent contractors, uh, so to speak. So they got to, you know, be able to look this, out for this, self. This, this is another thing. Every other sport has some other entity that's connected to the sport that helps the athletes out after their career is done. Boxing right. is the only sport that does not have that safety net. They don't have that safety net. You mm -hmm. have these fighters that, you know, they getting punched on, getting hit on, you know, going home to their wives and children looking any type of way just for a little bit of money because someone decided to take half of what you really supposed to got and just gave you some scraps. You know, but you're gonna take it because you just need some money. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like stuff like that in the concept of business. I don't like that in the sport, especially a sport that I participated in. Boxing was back in the day. They say boxing was the poor man's sport. People got into mm -hmm. boxing to try to make money for their families and etc. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we just want. I just feel as though that the managers, the promoters, and the people that's in the game, as well as the fighters, everyone should just completely play fair because we all in it for the same goal at the end of the day. We want a sense of, of stability, a foundation for our family and our loved ones and the people that we care about. And I think there's so many selfish people and miscorrupted people in the politics that's behind the scenes that have the ability to control these fights and this, that, and the third. Mm -hmm. And it, it's taken away from the, the true thrill of the sport. You know, it, it takes away from that. You know, you got a lot yeah. of guys that's really, really pushing and working hard because they want to generate some revenue. All we want is to just do. Yeah. Just give us what we work for. That's exactly. it. That's all. I mean, it, it's supposed to be like, you know, done as a partnership and things like that. I yeah. mean, you have some boxers that are out there, you know, that want to come up in the ranks and, and do the things as far as like fighting, who they want to fight in order to become the best. but they just don't have that particular opportunity or they don't have the ability to put themselves in a position to get those type of fights. And so I would say like right now, you have more of an ability to kind of like control more of that right. nowadays in comparison to previous right. years, because right. the days of, you know, kind of like fighting once every two weeks or once every yeah. 10 days, yeah. You know, that's pretty much out the window unless, it, you know, you just there just to, you know, get a couple yeah. pennies here and there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, but when you know that boxing is a business and then understand that, then you kind of like know, okay, what moves I have to make in order to, you know, get to the position that I want to get to and also, you know, protect myself in the process. Correct. And you know, they say the first rule of life is self-preservation. You know, even on the, on, the, on the airplane, they say in, in case of loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks are deployed. Put your mask on first, then assist others. Get your shit together before you can help somebody else, you know, basically. So I completely understand where you're coming from. I get it. I want to fight all the people that say they're the best. I stay ready. I stay in the gym. I'm always hungry. Anybody that can want it. So they have it. They can get it. Get it. Get it. I'm telling you. <laughs> so there you have it there, folks. WBC featherweight champion, Mr. Gary Russell Jr. here with the Boxing Source. Thank you, my brother. All right.